My name is David East, and I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, the panel for today, the Architectural Terracotta Collab panel, and the four artists who join us. Uh, one of them, I'm very fortunate uh, and honored uh, to uh, call both my friend, well, they're all my friends, to be honest, but one of them is actually my colleague at the Maryland Institute College of Art, who will be serving as moderator, Matt Karras. Um, I've been fortunate to know all of them since their time in graduate school, which is kind of an amazing thing to reflect on. Just to give you a little bit of context uh, for the project and the panel, the, uh, at Maryland Institute College of Art, um, we began uh, the Ceramics and New Technology Research <coughs> Initiative in 2008, uh, an initiative that has hosted speakers, supported curriculum and workshops at the Maryland Institute College of Art around the intersection of ceramics and new fabrication technologies. And growing within this context, the residency and activities that this panel uh, will address um, grow out of Matt's initiative and work in facilitating a huge and really incredible multi-part project uh, that garnered funds from the National Endowment for Arts uh, and its Artworks grant. Uh, the project uh, that they'll tell you more about was a three-week three week ceramic residency at MICA uh, for this group of artists that aimed to explore the intersection of historical architectural terracotta in Baltimore City um, within uh, and establish collaborative design practices, innovative tools, and new fabrication techniques to sort of address all of those issues. Uh, and now to the panel. Matt Karras uh, is a ceramic artist and designer, currently assistant professor at, of ceramics at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. He holds his MFA from New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred and a BFA from Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax. He's taught uh, and lectured and exhibited widely at universities and galleries in Canada and the United States. Seth Payne holds an MFA in ceramic art from Alfred University in Alfred, New York. He was an artist in residence at the Archie Bray Foundation for Ceramic Arts as well as the Watershed Ceramic Art Center in Newcastle, Maine. He's assisted in workshops at Haystack and Deer Isle at Aramont School. His work has won awards and been exhibited uh, throughout the United States. Tom Schmidt is an artist and designer and co-founder of Recycled China, a Beijing and U US based design team that transforms discarded ceramics and other industrial materials. Tom currently holds uh, the position of assistant professor of interdisciplinary 3D studio and digital fabri fabrication, excuse me, at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and has previously taught ceramic design uh, at the Alfred CAFA, Chinese, uh, China Central Academy of Fine Art, ceramic design for industrial program at, uh, in Beijing. He received a post-baccalaureate certificate from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, and went on to get his MFA at uh, Alfred University. His sculptural work um, has, is in numerous private collections and has been exhibited nationally and internationally. And lastly, Kayla Stein, uh, an artist and designer recognized for her innovative, non-traditional mold making and casting techniques. She recently completed a project examining the feasibility and sustainability of upcycling standard architectural terracotta brick into glazed decorative tiles. And she also does all of that while serving as the Director of Ceramics at the Sonoma Community Center in Sonoma, California. Kayla received her BFA from SUNY New Paltz in 2002 and her MFA from Alfred University in 2009. Please welcome this panel. Hi. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. I, there's a lot of thank yous that I want to make uh, that, that I'd like to, people to thank uh, David for all of your mentorship and, and help and assistance, and Sarah Barnes, the studio manager at MICA, who helped tremendously with all of this. We also had a whole crew of students that were helping and, and, and studio managers that were helping at MICA, David Hine and Sinem Oren uh, and Ryan McKibben that helped throughout the project, and uh, the NEA and also the Mount Royal Improvement Association. Mount Royal Improvement Association is a small neighborhood association that um, helped us with the project. Uh, and this group that really kind of trekked all from around the continent to, to kind of help with this, uh, to work on this project. So the structure of the talk is basically gonna be kind of like this. We're all gonna kind of go over what we worked on during the residency. 
and then uh, we'll have kind of a chance for discussion based off of, uh, yeah, what was, any questions from you guys and some questions that we have if there are time, if there's time. So there really kind of are three edges to this project. Uh, one of it is architectural terracotta. And uh, I guess one thing that's kind of important for you all to know is that um, Bolton Hill, which is the neighborhood uh, in which uh, MICA is situated, is on the uh, National Register of Historic Sites. It's kind of like, you can think about it as like a small national park. And a few <coughs> years ago, we were celebrating the centennial anniversary of the National Park Service. Um, and so as a way of celebrating, part of the reasons, uh, part of the reason that uh, Bolton Hill is, is a historic site is because of its architecture. It's got all these really beautiful row houses. Uh, in it with a lot of uh, beautiful kind of ornate architectural terracotta and brickwork. Um, and it's also kind of culturally a relevant sort of place in terms of it, it, well, F. Scott Fitzgerald lived there. There were a bunch of really fascinating kind of thinkers and makers that lived there. One of the biggest first Matisse exhibits took place in that neighborhood. Um, another edge to the project is digital fabrication and really just kind of figuring it all out and, and learning how to use some of those tools and a third edge to it is working collaboratively and kind of problem solving uh, together um, and so yeah this image that kind of shows some of us sort of working in the studio all together um, so we the, the the residency essentially was three weeks of us kind of collaborating and being in the environment of Bolton Hill and kind of inspired by the architectural terracotta that is there. Um, we also, we're, we were all in grad school together and Ezra Shales was one of our, our professors and we got really animated by his talks about the Dutcher Workbund and the Vienna workshops and when we got out of those lectures we basically kind of wanted to start one of those collaboratives together. And so uh, when it came time to kind of work on this we invited Ezra to come back and Ezra was kind of, well, he, he came to our residency and talked to us about uh, what we were working on. And then he came back a little later on and kind of, uh, well, de delivered a lecture. So this is Ezra in the digital fabrication lab. We're just kind of talking about what we were doing. So it was a great kind of way of working through ideas. And in there you see Ryan McKibben, who's helping us with the CNC milling machine, and David Hine, who's standing over at the edge. He's a student who was helping us with all of this. So that was uh, kind of one, one component of it, the presence of Ezra in there. Um, and we also built in a bunch of uh, walking tours. And so essentially we had uh, uh, participation with the Baltimore National Heritage Area. And so here you've got kind of a, a walking tour. We, we had two of them. One of them, one of the walking tours was for the group of artists. And then we had another walking tour that was uh, for the community. And that really allowed us to start collaborating with people that lived in Bolton Hill and that had lived in you know, these structures for a long time. So it was kind of a great way to kind of cross-pollinate. Um, Another aspect of the, of the residency was that we kind of organized workshops for students at a local art center. So while we were working on all of our stuff, we got students from uh, Jubilee Arts, which is a local art center, and we organized uh, a kind of simple tile making workshop to show people, show kids how tiles were kind of made. And that also led to other possible collaborations with the local middle and elementary schools. So there were a bunch of uh, you know, there was collaboration amongst us, but then there was also collaboration that was <coughs> starting amongst the community that I didn't really expect to have happen, but that ended up kind of occurring in there. Um, at the very end of all this, the artists went back to their own studios. The three weeks, I mean, it's really short in terms of sort of ceramic time. And so we really ended up making a lot of molds and tools and uh, everybody kind of went back to their home studios with these tools and started uh, and completed the works over there, came back to MICA and uh, presented a panel discussion, which this is sort of a version of. Ezra also was a part of that panel, and he delivered a lecture called Facing Work Together. And we had an exhibit that was in uh, one of the MICA galleries that uh, you see in that image down there. That's our Lighty Atrium. Um, another kind of component to this is that uh, originally MICA was a mechanics institute. So it now is a fine arts college, but uh, initially this was a place that where makers were kind of being trained in 
a kind of the scientific process and engineering kind of skills. And so there was some sort of parallel in terms of our exploration of digital fabrication that I saw with the sort of history of the college. So this is a membership uh, from the 1800s to the Maryland Institute for the Promotion of the Mechanical Arts. Um, so kind of interesting, it sort of started off that way and then that led to technical drawing and that later on led to life drawing and then led to sort of sculpture and painting. But originally the college was really about promoting the mechanical arts. Um, and these are some images of Bolton Hill just to give you a sense of the context. So the art college itself with a really well kind of uh, equipped digital fabrication lab within this context of historical examples was kind of the, the starting off idea, like what a great place to kind of be inspired by historic architecture. A couple of other examples of the brickwork that you'd see uh, in Bolton Hill. And this is from the Kent Museum in Connecticut of Mining and Industry. And you see it, I guess I can't kind of point to it, but yeah. This is the Baltimore block, which you can see over there, kind of a darker, shinier one. Um, and I guess another sort of component to this is that, well, architecture, uh, I think I see Neil down there. Neil, uh, in the introduction to Neocraft, you talk about sort of the geometry of the sort of different places that ceramics can go. And pottery is one place, and sculpture is another. And architecture is, is another sort of big place that, that ceramics can go. And my feeling was that within an uh, undergraduate program, architecture maybe doesn't get as represented uh, within education. So it was kind of an opportunity to show the students that this was another thing that they could do. Um, and uh, th so this is another sort of image of uh, architectural terracotta that you'd see in Bolton Hill. And I actually ended up within those walking tours talking to the, the person who owns this house. And he said, well, I saw the catalogs that you know the original owner uh, kind of ordered these these sort of ornamental keystones and sort of getting you know a little a little boy for the his son's bedroom and a little girl to go over his daughter's bedroom and um, another sort of image of these catalogs that you could order can point to and dress up your own building uh, in a way so a part of all of our of our project was about bringing this uh, content to students and just making it available to everyone. Um, Okay, a little bit now about uh, the projects that we worked on in there. So this is us, uh, not all of us, but in, in the digital fabrication lab, milling out these templates uh, that we used, uh, these forms that we used to cast uh, concrete tiles. Um, the first sort of collaborative project that we worked on were these pentagonal tiles. And so on the left-hand side, you see these, uh, they're milled out of acrylic, thick uh, acrylic, uh, like plexiglass. And what we were doing, is uh, uh, using concrete and coloring it with local clays, and I'll get to that in a <coughs> second, uh, and basically putting a sort of thin layer of colored concrete and backing it up with a heavier uh, uh, concrete at the back end. Uh, and it, it worked quite well, though we did end up uh, having some issues in terms of warping and cracking, so there were other iterations of this that happened later on. And um, I didn't come up with this pattern. This is something, uh, what you're looking at is basically Kirshner, Richard B. Kirshner's type seven uh, pentagonal tiling. Um, so in the summer of 1969, uh, in the issue of the Applied Physics Lab, uh, Richard B. Kirshner, who's a, a physicist and mathematician that worked at APL, wrote, uh, one of the oldest problems in Euclidean geometry is the problem of delineating those shapes that are suitable for tiles or paving stones in the sense that replication of a given figure can fit together to cover a flat area without gaps or overlapping. This is a, a sort of screenshot from that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, magazine, the, the, the APL's uh, digest the magazine in there with, with Richard B. Kirchner's, Kirchner's essay. Um, although the problem is deceptively simple to state how to tile a pentagon, it has proved remarkably refractory. I like that he uses that word in that moment. Uh, the author has succeeded in carrying out through a complex determination uh, in this special case of convex polygons. So Kirshner um, 
is sort of developing this at the time, and he thinks he's, the, the, he's completed the full set of possible ways of tiling a pentagon. Um, I'll get to some of this in, the, uh, a little, in, in a little bit. This is another little tool that we fabricated using the 3D printer. So essentially, this is kind of like a, a colored concrete separator that we could fit into a, a mold and pour different colored concretes into each section, then lift the, the separator out and backfill it with a heavier concrete. Um, so we tried all these kind of different approaches in there. And um, another thing that ended up happening, well, Sarah Barnes, our studio manager that I mentioned earlier, in the summer, uh, she runs an Onagama workshop, and she takes all of the students to the Stancil's Clay Pit in Perryville, Maryland. So we tagged along, and we dug clay in Stancil's and used it, essentially, to kind of color the clays. <coughs> and we also made some terra out of these. Um, OK, just a little now back. These are clay versions of those tiles that I ended up making. Um, so back to sort of this writing about Kirshner. There are a very limited number of ways that we've found to how to tile Pentagon, and Kirshner developed the math to solve for a number of these. In 1969, uh, Richard B. Kirshner, who, so he taught at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab just outside Baltimore, so he thought that he'd found the complete set of ways that a pentagon can be tiled. Uh, this, uh, this motif is, is one of these. It's the seventh type that was discovered in 69 or 68. Um, Although Kirshner wasn't correct, so more Pentagon uh, tilings were found a few years later, the problem still remains a challenge to solve, and the most recent pentagonal tiling was developed in 2015. And that brings us up to like 15 different ways of, of tiling uh, Pentagon. And there's something about this problem, like I, I'm interested in questions that won't go away that remain a challenge. And how to tile a pentagon, it kind of presents itself as a simple enough question, but it also persists. And in that sense, this tiling to me is a kind of an emblem of that kind of question. Um, and so this is sort of, uh, it's all terracidged. And in that sense, this tiling is kind of an emblem of that question and a return to that conceptual frame that Kirshner made in his text uh, in the APL Digest, a kind of a reference to ancient Greek tile making. Um, so yeah, these tiles coated in terra sigillata, a material that I'm sure you all know the <coughs> Romans used to make their clay impervious to water. Uh, Kirshner was an important part of the faculty at Hopkins APL, which it basically serves as a technical resource for, for the Department of Defense. Uh, Kirshner worked in missile research and helped develop some of the first GPS systems and surface-to-air missiles used by the Navy. So for me, the sort of the whole story about it is it gets kind of more problematic, but it also poses an interesting kind of interweaving of the areas of knowledge that we kind of might think of as quite disparate. Um, so a couple of issues that I, I think we all kind of encountered when we were working on all of these in the studio, a kind of a concern over loss of tradition and hand processes while we were working with these, these digital fabrication techniques. But in the end, I think the thing that, that we all sort of found is that the hand it doesn't really go away completely. There are always ways of weaving back towards a hand technique in there. It doesn't disappear. Uh, and so weaving traditional and contemporary ways of making things. Uh, so for example, you know, milling out a mold and then press molding uh, with it, or wood firing later on. So there are ways of going back and forth within hand and traditional techniques. Uh, and using digi the digital to find new forms um, as a kind of generative process. And there's one text that I'm slowly kind of chipping through that I'd recommend you all take a look at. Um, and it's The Sympathy of Things, uh, Ruskin and the Ecology of Design. It's a book by the architect Lars Spybrook. Uh, and also thinking about collaboratives as a model just to uh, learn new, new technology. It, it got really simpler in the sense when we were all working at the same problem together. Um, or, yeah, so just a few thoughts about that back to some of the projects that we we're working on. So this is uh, the Gale Crater. And by the way, all this work, you could see it. There's a, a gallery on Liberty Street. It's 937 Liberty Street. <laughs> and we have show cards over here if you all want to go see it. Um, the, so this is the Gale Crater. It's uh, a crater that's on Mars. And this tile is it's made from a topographical model of the Gale Crater from data collected by the high-resolution stereo camera on board the ESA's Mars Express mission. 
the Gale, Gale Crater is the site of the Curiosity rover's exploration of the Mars terrain. And part of the team that analyzes the samples discovered that the first definitive organic molecules on Mars is nearby uh, in Baltimore at the Goddard Space Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, the Gale Crater, to me, is like a large vase. It was a lake, and like pottery, it acted like a record of possible life on Mars. Uh, thinking about how pottery is sort of a recorder of history for us. Um, uh, it, it, sorry, the, the Gale Crater also has a relationship to telling time and history that I see as parallel with pottery. A lot of skill and careful work, power and dexterity and experience went into the ESA's mission and the work at Goddard. So I think, uh, to me anyways, it's fair to say that this is kind of an emblem for craft, this is the, the kind of model that um, if you go on the NASA website, there are all these, these models of different terrains that have been scanned. Um, and to me anyways, pottery is emblematic of technology too. It's just that we, we maybe we don't see it that way in 2018 in North America, though at some point and in some places, pots were and still are high tech. And so in this way, I kind, of, I kind of think of this crater as a more current vase uh, in terms of technology. Um, this is another uh, project that I ended up working on, Gaussian vermiculation. This is a series of tiles. And the pattern on these tiles was made by photographing the base of uh, the Carlton bookshelf uh, by Torres Sotsas. The vermiculated block that you see at the base is what I ended up kind of using in there. Um, so I took a photograph. This is from uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal. Um, I took this photo and then I blurred the image. Um, so this was sort of uh, another approach to making form. Um, I blurred this image and then converted, into it, converted it into a height map. And a height map basically uses value as a way to define, uh, as a way to define relief in there. Um, and so the darker values end up being lower and the higher values end up being sort of higher up to the ground. It's a function that you could use in this program called Rhino that we used. Uh, so Sotsas' uh, Sotsas, worked in ceramics, but uh, the Carlton shelf is, it's entirely built of composite materials, plastics and laminates. There's no ceramics there except maybe for this sort of masonry reference within the vermiculation. Vermiculation is a mode of rustication, and Sotsas uses it in a really typical architectural manner when he puts it at the base of the bookshelf. It, it's giving, uh, just as in architecture, it gives the base a kind of a visual weight. Um, and I, I ended up kind of thinking of vermiculation as a motif, a kind of an emblem of craft. And I'm thinking of craft work as a mode of rustication in everyday life that similarly uh, gives our life conceptual white, uh, weight and meaning and purpose. Um, in the Carlton bookshelf, Sotsas uses vermiculation as a way to acknowledge the craft of stone carving. And in this tile, uh, Sotsas's reference is returned back to stone, or almost. The blur is used to distort, but it's also emblematic of digital processes. Br blur functions in digital imaging software, they're largely reliant on a Gaussian to generate the blur effect. Uh, the Gaussian function, it basically blends uh, each pixel's color with the neighboring pixel uh, along a Gaussian with a bell curve uh, function that, that the user defines. Um, so in, in these tiles, the blur, it's both used as a kind of visual effect. It's, I, I kind of like how it's, it's hard to focus on it, and when you photograph it, it looks as if the whole thing is kind of blurry. Um, uh, but also to soften the carving and generate this, this height map. Um, but also I kind of see this Gaussian as a, as a kind of aesthetic of the digital. Um, this is a, another series of little florets that we photographed um, in the walking tour and, and just sort of walking around Bolton Hill. And uh, so uh, just to kind of go, I guess at this point I've talked about uh, two different approaches in terms of model making. The, the sort of resource of like looking online and finding models there, um, the approach of using a height map. And this is a th sort of third approach that I find myself using a lot uh, with Rhino and digital fabrication where I'll photograph or, or find photographs of an object. And then there's a function in Rhino that you can fold a photograph into the model and trace it. Um, so I, it's 
funny enough, it's sort of an analog process within, within this digital fabrication technique. Uh, bring the image in and trace the contours and from there generate a model. And the advantage I found to working that way was that the model's geometry ended up being really simple, so it's not very cumbersome for the computer to, to work with it. And you end up with a quite a, a robust kind of model in there that you could warp and, and change in terms of shape. This is another piece that you'd see uh, if you go visit the show on Liberty Street, um, this warped ornament tile. And I end up thinking about these objects as possibly the way that we experience them while we're either walking uh, and we're not kind of paying attention to it, the sort of deformation that you might uh, experience while you're sort of uh, walking by or experiencing the work. Um, thank you. Excuse me, I've had a little bit of a head cold, so. Um, my name is Seth Payne, and uh, I was part of this wonderful collaborative group and residency, and uh, I wanna thank Matt for putting this together, and, and Kayla and Tom for just being uh, great friends and great collaborators, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a really uh, a fortunate thing for me to participate in this. Um, I, uh, I maybe come from a slightly different perspective in terms of um, my work. Uh, I, I have a background, as David mentioned, in pottery and, and uh, especially functional work. And I also have a background in building. So I, I, um, I build houses and I remodel houses. And I think uh, the, the combination of those two things really informs both my work at large and also what I brought to the residency. This is a house that I built just across the river from where we are right now. It's probably a mile from here. And um, it's a, a thousand square foot, so it's pretty small, net zero house, like very well insulated, solar powered. and. Um, uh, one interest of mine is in sort of contemporary technologies in in building combined with, I guess, a, a kind of traditional sense of craft and uh, in finishing. And um, so I, uh, I think I have, I have, when I think about architecture, for me, a big part of it is thinking about domestic spaces at large and, and creating both objects in those spaces and then those spaces themselves. Um, one thing that I had in my mind uh, in line of this objects and spaces is uh, just these examples of where, you know, these, these single, uh, perhaps intimate objects change when they're stored or presented in a space, and this is actually in a submarine, also in Pittsburgh. I live in Pittsburgh, by the way. Um, that's uh, there's a submarine at the Science Center from World War II, and these cups are mounted and stored above the sink. It's a very, um, you can imagine, a very tight space, <coughs> and so this is like the super efficient utilitarian solution for storing these cups, which I also find to be quite beautiful with the repetition and the tessellation and just the elegance of it. Uh, so I, I, I look at examples that are purely utilitarian, like this one, as well as a kind of more conceptual example of the same idea of a space that is very uh, contrived and specific and also meant to sort of elevate utilitarianism. <coughs> In this case, this is Andrea Zattel. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, almost a commentary on that and, and maybe a bit of an extreme prescribed living that is, I find also a, a appealing, even though it might be a little bit dystopic at the same time. Um, and then here's another maybe more traditional pottery example. This is uh, 
Eva Zeisel, and these <coughs> these were kind of some experimental things that she did that were room dividers, so they were meant to be like architectural screens in a space, and the, the tessellation and the, the positive and negative space, as well as the, the use of color here is just so exciting to me, and I think really informs some of my work. So this is an example of something that I, that I have made that I think you see all of those elements in, as well as perhaps like a <coughs> shaker design and I, I put together this in, this series of I'm sorry this series of pots that are meant to be installed into uh, the the interior of a space and they are um, they're mounted on the rail and I was thinking a lot about about sh the shaker pegs and um, the the elegance of having this kind of storage that transforms individual objects into uh, part of the architectural space. They, they, and just seeing that transformation back and forth and how that feels as a, as a, as a user of those objects. So these cups are, <coughs> this, is all, this is all just kind of handmade. Obviously I you know, machined all those parts in wood and, um, and this is also, as Matt mentioned, there are some examples of these on Liberty Avenue, right a block away at the exhibition the uh, terracotta collab. Um, <clears throat> a, um, another part of that, I mean, thinking about that group, group of objects displayed and the individual object and also preparing for the residency, I made this series of cups that were, I, I guess I like to think about them as pots as bricks and just sort of stripping down that essential idea of what happens when you have an intimate object and then you then you present it in a group as a as a part of a, a kind of display of multiples and uh, and so this is a this is a kind of most basic version of that and these cups just stack together and uh, here's just a kind of grouping of them and I, I love the way they become like I said bricks or another way I like to think about this is like a quilt of patchwork, and it's also a really fun way to play with surface, and and again uh, tessellation and and patterning. And these are actually sort of triangular in, in in their shape, so they have this great flat side that really works well in a in a group. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about pots as groups, kind of going into the residency, and um, and then trying to think about how to use some of the digital tools kind of gets, gets me to the, the Bolton Hill project, which um, looking at some of the images of Bolton Hill before we arrived on site for the residency, I was really drawn to the, um, the formal elements of the, of, the, of the brick. And again, some of the same things that I've been talking about in other things that inspire my work, I like this sort of repetition and and tessellation and pattern, and I love the distressed surfaces of the brick and the and the colors and the tones and uh, and just the kind of simplicity of the ornament. The ornament, a lot of the Bolton Hill ornament is not from elaborate uh, relief. It's more from uh, slight variations in how how the bricks were set. So an example might be there'll be a course of bricks that instead of just having having them set with the faces out, they turn them so that you look at the corner of the brick, and that would be maybe a delineation between levels on the building. And so it's just a slight uh, change in presentation that creates this, this I think, quite exciting uh, minimal ornament. <coughs> I also was really taken with the, the wood elements of these buildings, and we we kind of set this residency up as an exploration of terracotta. I also, being a, a woodworker and having a, a sort of a lot of experience bringing together clay and wood especially, I was really struck by how elegant the wood components of these buildings tied together with the brick and often with stone. And you had this really just elegant uh, melding of materials that seemed so. Uh, it seems it, it seemed to be so exquisitely kind of informed by one another. <coughs> uh, 
as Matt mentioned, you know, a big uh, one of the uh, the three corners, as he put it, of this residency was the idea of collaboration, and I think that there were a number of ways that that manifested itself. One was what's portrayed in this image was that we, when we arrived at the residency, we kind of arrived with all of us not knowing what we were going to do. So we kind of looked at each other to get a sense of where to start. And one of the projects that kind of came out of that initial brainstorming was a project that I think w wasn't on any of our radars, and that was this cement tile project that Matt mentioned. And I, I really loved the idea of the cement tile because it was not in our backgrounds, any of us. So it was this new territory that we could all sort of try it out together as a, as a, as a group endeavor rather than it being our individual work sort of referred off of each other. And again, I think we ran into some limitations with the time we had to work on that. But I think there were a lot of very exciting things that happened with that project. And, and, um, and then later, as we collaborated after the residency was over, I think it kind of became more of what I think a lot of collaboration is now, which is remote. You know, we all live in different parts of the country, so we were having group Skypes and we were sending files to one another and having each other edit our files. And I also think there's something very interesting about that in terms of a commentary on how artists are working together now with the technology that we use. Um, so I feel like we, we, we really explored collaboration. We touched it in a lot of different ways. And I, I, I think we all agree that we would love to see where that might lead in the future. Um, this was the cement tile project. And what, what the idea here was is that uh, Matt had his, uh, the five-sided pentagonal tile research that he had been doing with uh, Kirshner. And we were looking at ways that we could create these sort of uh, encaustic tiles, which is a traditional method, but not using a ram press or not using uh, a very fussy method of fabrication and also using our access to the digital tools to create quick stencils that would allow us to build those tiles. And it, I think it, for the most part, it was, it was very successful. We had some technical problems with the, with the cement and, and we, we would have to do some revisions in that project. But the surfaces were beautiful. We were using uh, the, the locally dug clay with Terra Sige, and because it was a raw surface, all the color of the clay and the local kind of nature of the clay was was maintained. It didn't fire out. <coughs> this is a, a was this is the color of that clay. I mean, this is a sort of uh, just a wipe of the landscape, and you can see the richness of that color. So we had these just beautiful, rich earthen tones that that kind of thinking about like Goldsworthy's work where he's using clay and you just get the full effect of the natural material. Um, the other thing that I was using the residency as an opportunity for was to develop, uh, well, let's just say to learn basics in uh, 3D modeling. And I, I, I didn't have any really experience with Rhino, so I, I wanted to bring a project to the residency and see that I could just work through this project as part of this um, having access to the tools and, and the resources and the expertise. So I, I had a cup design that, I, um, that I'd never, you know, I didn't model it or anything. It hadn't existed in the physical world. And I wanted to just see what it would be like to entirely render that digitally and then produce it digitally and what, what the result would be. So I spent a lot of time in, in, during the residency just learning how to build this thing in Rhino. And there were some pretty amazing discoveries I made. I mean, I, as someone who makes things with my hands, I, I was taken with how a lot of, especially in Rhino, I don't have any experience with other software. The, the, the program itself seems to be geared toward makers and a lot of the tools are tools that you guys would be familiar with, like wire cutting and extruding. And there's an elegance to it that I didn't expect. And I, I, I got really 
into the software. Um, so, and then there are other things that are just kind of amazing, having been in the studio and working manually with like trying to stack things together, for example, where, you know, rims and feet have to fit perfectly together. And this, this image shows a kind of shadow of a stacking cup inside of the one below it. And I was able to take, imagine being able to stretch the, um, the form of the one below and have the form above also mirror that change at the same time. So there's this kind of way that you can collapse so many steps into one, and yet it still has the same kind of uh, physical reference. It's a familiar reference. Uh, but but I, I find it to have a lot of potential in terms of designing. Uh, the, another thing that I was interested in is how it could, I could collapse a lot of different processes into, because I, I do a lot of slip casting. Most of my work is slip cast, and it's mold driven. And I'm, you know, I'm very, it's just a very tedious process. I make all of my own molds. I make all of my own forms. And a lot of my molds are complicated. And um, I love the idea that I could design a model, a positive model, and then also design the mold, and then even design the case mold, basically all in one process, and then end up with a kind of easily re reproducible uh, uh, sort of starting point in a uh, physical. So this. So I, I designed the, the mold and then the case mold, and I started milling it out of rigid foam. And it, I, there was, I was already feeling like it was exciting, but it was kind of like it didn't, quite, it didn't quite catch me. And then I had this kind of spontaneous thought of, what if I milled the case mold out of, out of a chunk of wood, just like a raw chunk of wood, not a perfect laminated piece of plywood, but just a chunk of hemlock. And I, I did this, and it was like, suddenly for me, all these things kind of went off. It just was so exciting to see this cup form inside of a, of a piece of wood. And, and, and I, I can't quite explain it, but it just kind of, because I have a lot of wood in the finished results of my pieces, and it was sort of interesting to have it then turned around and be in this early stage of, of the kind of mold making. And... Um, and I, I, I think looking back on this, you know, there's been a lot of talk at this conference, and I think it's an ongoing conversation with digital tools. Uh, how do you keep spontaneity in these processes? They're kind of top heavy. You're, you're oftentimes spending a lot of time before you're producing any results just with an idea or a concept, and you have to kind of trust that thing. And I think those of us who are used to having material feedback, are, are asking questions about how that might work if there is no material feedback. And I'm, I'm still asking those questions, but one of the things that I discovered in this, particularly this little variation, was I had a spontaneous idea that was not part of my plan, and it suddenly changed, in my, in my mind, it changed the entire direction of what this piece was becoming. Um, so. We, we talked a lot about David Pye during the residency and the workmanship of risk and how we could, you know, bring that spirit of risk into these, these digital tools and into the way that we're combining, perhaps, the tactile and the digital. Um, so this, so after the three weeks were over, I had that wood, you know, uh, block mold, basically, and... I took that to my home studio and I put coddles on it and made the slip molds. And so this is this is them coddled up. I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this this is a cup that was the result of that of that. So this is the Rhino designed cup, and it was so interesting to actually cast this cup and then have it in my hands and just be like. I didn't recognize the object. It was it looked and felt foreign to me. It felt like it had been uh, built behind glass, which in a way it kind of had, and that was part of the experiment. And um, 
I, I sort of lost interest in it, to be honest, at that point, because it, it didn't feel like I knew it. And, and some, some part of this, I think, maybe was just the unfamiliarity I had with it physically, and maybe it, took more, it would take more time. I also do think that for me, I, 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 one of my uh, sort of discoveries in this experiment was I need to have the, the physical feedback at some stage in the process. And it, it's really important to me to understand an object, how it feels, how it, you know, how, how, how it meets the hand, the size of it in my hands. All of those things are critical. And, um, and, and so I, I, I was... Maybe you uh, could just turn them off. Yeah. Can I? I wish I could. Yeah, they could be off. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> the computer? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what it feels like. Um, but that being said, the the idea when when I made the the block mold out of wood, that uh, that ended up uh, becoming the thing that excited me the most in the end result. So. You can't see it in that picture, but this is a detail shot of that same cup, and you see the wood grain in the final cast. And I just, for me, that's the starting point where I would go with this experiment next, is how to really try to emphasize the wood material early in the, in the stage. And because of the digital tools, I can do that. And, and, and one of the things I keep thinking about with the digital tools for me is, how can I do something that I can't do otherwise, like a new thing. It's not meant to replace a, a step necessarily that I can do by hand and maybe it's slower. It's meant to create a new possibility. And so th for me, this was where I saw in that experiment the new possibility. Um, but I also abandoned that form <laughs> and started thinking about the same piece I was going to make, which refers back to the submarine slide. and. This was a this was a kind of after I got back to my studio and I was kind of reworking the cup and I was really trying to think about how to emphasize the sculptural elements of it as it would be presented when it was stored and displayed. Um, and my typical studio process involves a lot of wax casting. I'll make a I'll make a model with clay and then I'll make a, a quick mold and cast it in wax and then that I can really kind of tool and handle and. Um, and then it's easy to make a mold off of that that will maybe be the final slip mold. Sometimes sometimes it takes a couple stages. And then this is when I was actually starting to cast these cups in my studio. And um, I went back to Rhino to work on the wood element. So part of this piece was always going to be I had this wood sleeve that the cups were going to be sort of stored and, and presented in. And I, I, this is an example of a thing that it would be very difficult for me to do by hand. There, there, there was a, a, a cylindrical shape within a uh, kind of box shape out of uh, a piece of walnut, like a kind of precious piece of wood. And I, I designed this in Rhino using my remedial Rhino skills. And then I used a, a fab shop in Pittsburgh that does a lot of kind of architectural work and, and uh, furniture and they milled this for me, so I took the file over there. And uh, that also was a, was a part of, I felt like that was a relevant part of the experimentation because I'm not affiliated with the university, and one of the things that has, has really uh, come up for me with this project is, is access to these tools. And who, how democratic is it? I mean, there's a lot of talk with with this kind of digital revolution with 3D printing that it means everybody can be a manufacturer of their own worlds. And I think in my experience with this project, of course I'm using CNC and it's you know very specific, but it's actually quite the opposite. I think these tools are very, very expensive to have access to. And we had a, we had a tech shop here in Pittsburgh up until just recently and it closed down because it wasn't, it wasn't financially viable it was one of those where you pay like a monthly fee to use it like a gym. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot, to my, in my mind, there's a lot of question around how moving forward we, we make 
this equipment accessible, if it's really accessible, and kind of being honest about that stuff. Because I think those of us who are fortunate enough to be associated with a university, I shouldn't say us because I'm not, but uh, I think we can oftentimes take for granted that all of that equipment and all of those technicians and all of that maintenance is just there. And uh, it's, part of the, it's part of the package. Um, and then here's, here's a, the, this final piece as it worked out it, that's over uh, on Liberty Ave. And if you have time to check it out, I, I, I think it ended up, I was wanting to work with a gradient of Terrasage, and this, this to me is kind of referring back to the bricks and that, that subtle weathering and variation in the bricks. Of course, this is a kind of much more uh, shaped version of that. And uh, here's just a detail shot of that piece. And um, I think, you know, for me, again, to summarize the digital tools, I, it's really important that for me in my studio as I move forward that I'm going to use it as a way to do something new. And there are lots of things that I think I can do better with my hands. And I also think that the digital tools don't stand alone. So it's not, it's not a singular process for me. It's, a, it's part of a back and forth and a, a reference between the hand and those, those fabrication methods. It's another tool in the studio. So, thanks. Hello, thank you all for coming. I'm Kayla Stein. Um, uh, let's see, I'd like to thank Micah, the National Endowment for the Arts, David East and Sarah Brown from, or Barnes from Micah, um, David Hine, who was my, um, sort of an extension of my hands using the digital fabrication um, and design tools, um, Ezra Shales for coming back and working with us on this project, and of course, um, my studio that's based at the Sonoma Community Center where I work. Um, and Seth, Tom, and Matt, thank you. So the, um, the opportunity to come together for this residency was re really pivotal for my practice. Um, because I run a community studio, it's rare that I have focused time to get away. So the format of a residency, something that's funded, something that takes you out of your daily life um, is pretty valuable. So um, it was an amazing opportunity. Um, we were able to all right. <laughs> we were able to um, learn about this um, historic site, Bolton Hill. We were able to explore Baltimore um, through the clay digging, through living there for three weeks, and um, through meeting a lot of the community through this project. This work was made um, as part of my thesis exhibition, and um, my Practice is largely process driven. I use a lot of molds, slip casting, and repetition uh, to explore pattern, to make larger forms and installations out of individual objects and repeating forms. Uh, this piece is about 40 feet long and consists of 1,700 goblet forms. Um, it's called Convivium, and it represents a coming together a celebratory space and um, transcending the autonomous object into something larger. This piece is significant because it um, explores the, the form, it explores the process, a breakdown of the mold making, a model making system. This is uh, more close to my current work. Um, I call these architectonic vases or tectonic vases, and these are all slip cast using a modular mold system. So I could make multiple parts and strap them together to make one-offs out of the same molds or out of the library of mold parts that I have. And then I do a lot of handwork after they come out of the molds to clean them up, to add a um, pattern, add depth to the surface. And um, the Molds themselves are, the mold parts themselves are made similar to the way we made the concrete tiles, where it's 
It comes off of the tabletop. The tabletop offers that flat surface in one way, and the plaster slabs are cast out of a frame of some sort. And this is the piece out of that mold. <coughs> So with this residency, I wanted, I also don't have access to uh, digital fabrication uh, studios um, working at the community center. So I wanted to, to uh, use this opportunity to make um, a larger uh, multi-part mold where it was revolved. So uh, creating a system where the model, the coddle system, and uh, the casting way would work um, with a repetition and a curve. So this was the model we came up with. It was based off of that uh, previous form, the vase form with the, the bump in the neck. And um, it was modeled to be about 20 inches tall and 20 inches wide. And so this is a bird's eye view of that same thing, showing that uh, kind of that footprint or the division um, of the mold itself. So by making one uh, model and one caudal system here and repeating it 16 times, I could make a full circle. So this shows a, pr a plastic printed model um, that's the 20 inches long and then the acrylic slabs um, that hold in the plaster that gets screwed to the model. So we printed this. Um, each, each part uh, took probably I think it was like 12 hours approximately for each part um, to be printed. And uh, then the hardware is embedded into the surface of the plastic. And um, using this material as a model as well as a coddle system is a really great um, non-porous, durable surface. So the model it doesn't really break down um, and it it's easily constructed and taken apart each time the, the plaster is cast into it. So the, the mold making system itself became an efficient, or, or this system became an efficient way to make multiple mold, mold parts. Uh, the design is loosely <coughs> based off of some of the arch bricks found in Bolton Hill. So um, creating a revolve based on those angles, looking at the bricks and the patterns in the bricks in different orientation and kind of thinking about some of those same words, um, extrusion and revolve and those things that come out of the digital uh, programming, but also that come out of the studio first. And so this is a, um, the beginning of some of those parts being printed. And these are pretty small plastic printers. I think their maximum height is about um, <coughs> seven inches or so. So that's why we broke down the mold into the different parts. It also um, allowed us to uh, kind of not, you know, not mill something for 35 hours, but um, just commit some time to each additional part uh, so that if it failed overnight that we could just reprint another 10 hours instead of another 30 hours. <coughs> and then this is the, the model system with the mold, with the plaster in it. So I would pour the plaster in, and then when it was at that cream cheese consistency, take away part of the acrylic and screed off the top of the plaster to create that shape. So it reduces the weight of the mold. It, um, it creates a pretty quick um, uh, mold part that also becomes architectural in itself. So you can see that these mold parts that are quite sizable, they become perhaps a suggestion of architecture, of a cornice, a crown molding, a buttress. I have these pieces in the show, or I have a parts, parts of this mold in the show as well. Um, seeing the, the, this type of mold part with this interesting outer edge as well as the information on the inside um, made me a little hesitant to, to even cast the piece. I, I felt pretty good about the plaster itself, um, but as a slip caster and someone that uses molds to make ceramic objects, um, the follow through with casting was important. So at first I, uh, I slip cast the form using a porcelain casting slip and um, just technically speaking, the scale um, is, 
is very challenging. It took about 25 gallons of slip to fill the mold, and we displaced uh, quite a bit of it with a five-gallon bucket by lowering that down um, into the mold with a bag of clay in it. So, um, and then vacuuming it out with a shop vac. And it, it's a beautiful cast. Um, there was a lot of problems with the shrinkage and uh, pulling away from the mold, having the weight of the form um, hold itself up or failing to hold itself up. Um, so at least I got some photos. <coughs> it's all about process. Um, and you know, this was a good thing. I I wanted it to be terracotta because of the um, the residency and the origin of this model. So. The failure of the slip casting, uh, you know, pushed me to to try the mold in a different way. So I resolved the issue by pressing slabs of clay into the mold, and then standing up the mold and seaming each piece together by pressing more clay on the inside. So it became this hybrid object of um, 3D printing, um, casting, screeding, which is an ancient plaster technique. Um, failed slip casting and then pressing. And so um, keeping that information of, of the pressing on the inside was important to me to show that process. Um, in the show, it's exhibited a little bit high, so you, can, you don't really have access to seeing that inside, that interior of, of the very kind of touched, soft clay. You see more of the exterior where you see the printed information, you see the clay, the clayness of it, and the architectural. Um, aspect of it. And this is it before it's fired. So I, um, I'm drawn to the conceptual space of the park of places where humans and the natural world intersect, where there's an intervention there. Um, the park, the garden, these places that are planted and organized by humans have a utopic quality to them. They have a beautiful quality to them. Um, it's a way that humans may think they have control or some kind of influence on nature, or the natural world. But I love these patterns that you see, um, whether it's every day or the special, you know, special views of flying. Um, so that brings me to the park that we lived next to in Baltimore. This is uh, Rudder's Mill Park right near MICA in Baltimore. And um, this is a reminder to me of my connection to the land, to the bucolic setting that I'm used to living in, and also the importance of a park in a city, in an urban area, where it's, it, it's a reminder of what was there before the city was there, but it's also a place, again, to convene, to have a convivium, or uh, to play, to be a family. And it's always a, seems to be a positive place, a respite. Um, so remember that for the next, uh, the next project. Um, this is some ornamental um, iron that's found in Bolton Hill. These are quite common, window guards and uh, door guards, gates. A lot of the ornamental cast iron was made in Baltimore by the Krug Company, which still operates today. And um, as we were taking our historic tour, the tour guide pointed out that um, a lot of these are reminiscent of what you might find in, find in New Orleans, and they were exported to New Orleans and made in Baltimore. So I you know, thought that that was a really interesting cultural um, uh, anchor in terms of like exporting, manufacture. And when we came to Baltimore initially, I was actually quite surprised of the, the minimal ornament that were on these brick homes. Um, when we were planning the project, Matt sent us a bunch of photos that he took, and he focused in on the ornamental tile. So I came to Baltimore thinking, it's all ornamental, it's wrought with these flowers and patterns, and I was a little bit disappointed. So this kind of fulfilled um, my desire to work with ornament in some way. And um, the lovely thing about that is like the Krug company is still producing these. Um, it's a historic company, um, historic methods. So again, it comes back to the craft and the manufacture of these homes. 
So what I did is I uh, photographed some of the, the iron work and isolated out certain elements of the, the ornament to create extrusion dies. So here you can see a few images and a few shapes that are um, simplified, maybe bulked up a little bit uh, to create a good extrusion die. And my thought for these, um, these are sort of um, proposals for park furniture or um, playground furniture, benches, things that could be um, blown up and um, interacted with in a park setting or in an outdoor setting that really connects um, to the place that they were found in. So Bolton Hill, these could be furniture um, or benches for, for a Bolton Hill Park, for a park in Baltimore. Um, and they're really, the, you know, making the pieces themselves is a pretty direct process. We use the laser cutter to um, cut out the forms out of plywood, and then I extruded them um, with terracotta. So after the extrusion is made, they can be twisted, cut, distorted into different forms and shapes to then become other pieces themselves. So this, you know, I'm kind of approaching this as a designer. This could be a proposal for other places besides Baltimore as well. Um, and uh, it came up in the talk when, when we were at Baltimore, or at MICA, that um, the Bolton Hill is a place of conflict, that there was a, the Baltimore uprising in April 2015, and that by offering um, these pieces for a park to gather on, it becomes a political statement to offer um, maybe a gesture of peace or a gesture of convivium again um, through these pieces that are easily accessible and could be interacted with. And that's the end. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, of course, thank you to, to Micah and to everybody in this collaborative project with me and to all of you for enduring the light show earlier. Mm. I think it might be Seth's psychic energy or something <laughs> that really kicked that in. Um, so um, <clears throat> I also want to move a little quickly so that we still have a little time for conversation. And, and we really want to welcome questions from, from everybody, as well as comments around some of the, the approaches that we've taken and just the idea of collaboration, the use of digital fabrication in general. Um, these are all topics that I know are, are very present in everybody's mind. Um, but first, I want to just briefly share some images from my previous work, this is actually way back in grad school where we all were at um, Alfred, graduated in 2009. And when I um, approached this residency, I think a lot of this did, does still tie to my previous work, which is very much about exploring material phenomena. And in this case, um, it's really studying um, paper and the, and the texture of paper to make molds off of and then turning that into, into modular systems and thinking of this as a kind of architectural systematic skin. Um, similar approach and interest in material uh, phenomena with, with ink. This is pools of ink that I photographed and then turned into ceramic decals, which are then applied to these porcelain cast vessels in a kind of nod to uh, Qinghua decoration. Um, then after graduate school, um, I had the opportunity to go to the Central Academy of Fine Arts, where, where I taught in the Alfred Kaffa design program. And we would take these field trips to Jingda Zhen, which I'm sure many of you know, some of you may have gone, just this amazing um, capital of, of porcelain. And one of the byproducts of all of the production, including factory production, are these scraps. And so you'd see all of these um, factories with piles of, of any sort of flawed fired work. And so with these plates, my students helped me to bring them back to Beijing and started doing some experiments with them, one of which was to crush them all down. And this was a really fun day. Um, we crushed them all down and turned them into an aggregate, which we then, um, after we tried a bunch of different things, but ultimately we ended up using recycled aluminum 
as a kind of binder. So we poured recycled aluminum onto this recycled porcelain, and, and this is now an ongoing project with my, with my uh, collaborator, Jeffrey Miller, who's still based in China. And linking it a little more closely to this project, we used brick <coughs> for one of these, and, and many of you may know about how um, China's really leveling a lot of old neighborhoods to make way for high rises. So, so we were able to scavenge a lot of bricks from particular neighborhoods around Beijing for this project. So now, um, when I approached this project in Bolton Hill, um, when I was thinking of architecture, one of the, the artists whose work really came to mind is Doho Su, who's a South Korean artist. And I was really amazed by this particular work um, and, and really the way in which he captures this ephemeral quality in architecture. You know, we think of, of buildings, particularly brick buildings, as being these almost permanent, these static, heavy forms. And he managed to maintain the form of, of this, this actual building. This would have been in, in Providence, I believe. Um, but transformed into this lightweight, fibrous, soft material. And, and in thinking and walking through Bolton Hill, I wanted to somehow capture a sense of time and some ephemeral quality in the architecture. Um, so for me, Bolton Hill really became a kind of site that I could use as a, as a source of inspiration, not necessarily responding to the, the architecture itself, but thinking of not necessarily producing architectural pieces, but thinking of it as a kind of inspirational jumping off point. Um, we spent a lot of time walking around the neighborhood, staring upwards. Um, after a few days, we had pretty sore necks from looking at everything from that vantage point. Um, but I was drawn in particular to things like this, which were the ways in which bricks had worn down over time and revealed aggregate. Um, the way in which this same facade, one half had been painted, one not, and you could see the weathering taken place on the side with the, with the paint. So there's again a sort of capturing of time on this facade. This is some of the, some of the cooler pictures of just seeing how these brick walkways eventually were were taken over by the trees that continue to grow underneath them, and in some cases completely absorbed by the trunks. Um, so one of the first buildings, and I think Matt, you have a picture of this as well, this is 1500 Park Avenue in Bolton Hill, and we lovingly refer to this as the specimen house eventually because there was all of this architectural ornament that we were drawn to, um, <coughs> and I was, looking at this particular garland motif and never having really used, like Kayla was mentioning, uh, the sort of ornament that, that we were exploring. You know, this is something I hadn't done before in my own work, and so I really wanted to also latch onto ornament as, as a jumping off point. Um, and so Matt had gotten this, this 3D model architectural kit, actually. It was like a collection of of 3D models that that were Rhino files that we could work with, and so I used them almost as these virtual sprigs, and just kind of added them and built form out of these out of these ornamental pieces, and then that became a, a 3D printed object. And um, I thought, in in some cases, maybe the piece doesn't need to be um, clay to be about the ceramic, about the terracotta. So. I wanted to leave this actually as this translucent print and, and seeing it as more of this kind of ephemeral, um, semi-transparent thing. Um, similar idea, using ornament for a 3D print. So this was uh, at UNC Charlotte. We just acquired a, a clay printer, which, which we're slowly figuring out how to use. And um, this is the first successful print with it. Um, and then here again, a site where, where nature has taken over. And so this is a ivy-covered brick garage in the corner of Jenkins Alley and Mosher Street um, in Bolton Hill. And we all really wanted to tackle new technology um, in this residency project. And for me, the thing I wanted to explore mostly was 3D scanning. And so this is a video that shows um, a 3D scan that was generated by taking a lot of photographs of this, this site. And still learning how to use this software. Um, there were some glitches from, from 
the way I said it, but also from the movement of the leaves and the software not being able to necessarily capture that movement. And I really love the way in which it translated this site into an image. And so that 3D scan then became a texture which I could then wrap in Rhino. And so I used that surface and created this kind of oval form and printed that object. And the hope um, really was to ultimately cast this one in terracotta, although the, the example in the exhibition is the 3D printed model here. So then another site um, was also this, these cast iron um, flower boxes. And so I scanned this. And um, in order to do the 3D scanning, this particular process involves taking a bunch of photographs from different angles, and the software stitches it together. And so here's an example of the workflow. So once I've stitched together all those photographs, it's be become this 3D model, and then a mesh. And I use the color information from that 3D scan in Photoshop, and I essentially am removing information. And then th I use the laser cutter to actually center some of the line work from that 3D scan onto a ceramic tile. Um, so that's a process that I could go into s more depth about. If, if you have questions later, um, you can ask me about that. And then finally, adding ceramic decals of some of the color information. This is the final piece there. And then lastly, um, this is one last site, 1709 Park Avenue. And this is an archway um, that I was drawn to. And I also did the same process of 3D scanning and using a laser to transfer some of that data onto the tile. But in this case, I did a reductive process. So it's a little bit more like a laser sgraffito. And so the laser is actually cutting through a layer of terra sigillata onto a white on gobe. So so creating that line work out of it. Thank you. So, Matt, are we can open up to questions now. Yeah, to you. we do. We have there's a microphone in the center aisle, and we have a little bit of time for for questions and discussions. If anybody has uh, any thoughts, or but if you do, please step up to the microphone. That way, the the recording will will capture your question. Hello. Was your laser cut pr pieces, were they greenware when you were lasering them, or were they fired? What was the process in doing the that? The sintering of the glaze? Yes. So <clears throat> the tiles had been fired with a myolica glaze, and then they were coated with, with a glaze once again, and then the line work um, was sintered directly onto those tile, and then the excess glaze was washed away. Um, so it's only that area that the laser is hitting that's actually fusing to the tile. And if you're curious about it, actually, I meant to, m to mention up there, this was largely inspired by a workshop that happened last year in Portland by, um, it's Benny Hill. There's a, there's a video you can watch from the Oregon College of Art and Craft. So look up last year's in Sika, and he kind of goes through that process. So that was the beginning of the, the research that I jumped off from in this project. So the tire tiles are fired, and then you coat them with glaze, and it or that's right. Okay. Yep, coated with glaze, and then it fuses pretty well, but it doesn't set very strongly, so it's fired again. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Those tall columnar uh, forms that were printed. Um, how many hours did it take for you to print something of that height? Which, wor which work are you referring to? Uh, there was a photo in your presentation of a tall column with in front of windows. Oh, that one. So that it, it looks like the column is as tall as I it's am. It's not actually th oh. the vantage point. Hey, <laughs> yeah. perspective. Yeah. Cheater. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. I didn't realize that vantage point did that. Yeah. That's cool. Oh, I, no, uh, I, I was thinking you long. printed something like this. I'm thinking like three weeks later, everyone else right. is waiting. No, for and that. actually, I teach digital fabrication at UNC Charlotte. And the first thing 
I ask students is, you know, how long they think this little trinket that I hold up will take, and, and many think it's quite quick if they don't have that experience, but printing is slow. That object probably took about 24 plus hours. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> I, th I think that brings up an interesting um, predicament, I guess, that that Seth touched on in his talk too, um, just about um, working on the screen, designing on the screen, designing in a program, printing. Every th all the scale is thrown off um, in terms of perception, actual time, and then what happens in the kiln too with shrinkage and movement of the clay, distortion. So um, I know that's it's kind of uh, tangential to your question, but I think there's an interesting element to, to that, um, whether it's an unexpected or expected. And of course, you get more of a sensibility for the material and the process as you continue to work with it. But often, um, I think these objects do kind of transcend scale or percepted scale, not only when they're in the photograph, but when they translate from the screen through the printer to the mold to the fired piece. Because Seth, you were saying that you, when you cast your mug, you just, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't your work anymore in a way. Yeah. You kind of um, omitted that or edited that, edited that out. <laughs> I guess if, if I could add to that uh, another thought, just in my mind, there's a kind of a similarity in terms of a, a challenge in, in terms of feedback loop yeah. that you get within. So ceramics, uh, you don't what you see is not necessarily what you get, and the same is true with digital fabrication. There's a challenge in terms of being able to feedback off of what what you've made, and there's a space in between those two things. So what's on the screen is not necessarily what the object is going to end up looking like or, or feeling like to handle it in the, in the case of your your cup mm -hmm. in there and so but it in, in some ways it's also a kind of an opportunity I think that we all kind of realize in terms of ceramics that sometimes what you expect to have is is not what you get but maybe you get something that you is a total surprise and and that's one thing that I've kind of encountered with this kind of technology um, a, and maybe a kind of a similarity with ceramics in mm -hmm. there No, we were all kind of involved with all of that. So the walking tour, we kind of, uh, so the, the, I don't know if the mic picked that up, but the question was whether or not I was uh, the only one involved with the community. And um, you know, we were all kind of involved with the walking tours and the workshop in there. Um, and the, I guess the stuff that happens later on that is a, is a product of this, that I'll, I'll be kind of the boots on the ground in, in Baltimore to do that. But um, yeah, we were all kind of involved in that. And another thing I didn't mention is that uh, we also invited people from Bolton Hill to just come and visit the residency while we were working on stuff. So we walked through the studio, showed work in progress, and um, and got kind of a, a critique also <laughs> from the community. It was kind of it was an interesting thing, but it was an enriching thing. Um, yeah. Well, ah, one more question. Hi, thank you. That was great. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the experiences that I've kind of focused on with the use of digital technology is how it really enables collaboration because it's uh, translatable. Like it's you're sending a thing to someone else almost. Uh, do you guys plan to continue collaborating in this way, um, or is digital important for that for you, or how how has that changed the way that you plan to collaborate? That's a good question. I, I can start. Yeah, sure. So I think that it became quickly apparent how helpful it was with being able to collaborate remotely, for sure. Like, there's no yeah. way we really could have followed through with a lot of these projects after this short three-week residency were it not for the ability to email an STL file and open it up on each other's screen. Um, for, for instance, Matt has access to a decal printer, which I don't, and so I was able to simply send him a stack of JPEGs through Google Drive. Um, Seth was modeling forms, which I think you sent to Matt, right? And he helped sure. you you work on. So, so in that way, it's definitely 
shown us all that it's a really useful format for collaboration. Um, in terms of where it would go next, I, I definitely hope that we, we continue to work on it, but we still have uh, to determine in what form that takes. We really hope to bring this to another site because we do feel that as much as we can collaborate remotely, ceramics and these processes are, are um, such that we know there needs to be an actual tactile physical space that we're actually meeting at as well. So it can't be all or like one or the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we're, we live so far away from each other. So there's the, this facility to be able to exchange uh, form, which is it's, it's challenging to communicate long distance. That ends up being quite possible. In the end, it, it's helpful to be in the same studio and really handle the work and look at the work. But it, that was one of the, the elements of this, that it made it possible to be able to send things all the way to California and, uh, and have something be made over there. Um, so in that sense, I think the technology is really kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously, there are plenty of other possibilities, I think, that, that kind of come from it. But um, yeah, kind of well suited towards these sort of long distance uh, collaborations in there. And I think maybe one, one other piece I'd like to add to that is that I think it's, it shows that a lot of the work we took on were actually a lot of personal undertakings, um, but that collaboration, there was a tile collaborative project, but we also very much gave each other feedback and were able to, to kind of offer input, which I think is also worth noting that working in a collaborative sort of team environment and that having that sort of relationship set up allows you to to get the kind of feedback that you may not have since being a student, you know, and we were able to take things on that I don't think you could necessarily take on on your own. And just having people that you know and trust that you can bounce ideas off of and be willing to trust their points of view on it and mm -hmm. maybe even more so than you trust your own at times. Yeah. And that's something that could happen remotely. But it comes from, I think, having the physical time together f sort of behind it. So again, kind of, I would reiterate what Tom said about it's the combination of the two. And I think for me, the, the, part, the project, that, the cement tile project that we were truly inventing together, I, I was very excited by that. And I think the time limitation was a bit frustrating. It would be nice if we could have come back together physically to revisit that project and um, see it through. Uh, that said, I, I still think it informed a, a level of trust in each other and an ability to, to go to each other to finish the other work that we were working on. Mm -hmm. So if anybody knows of an institution that would love to host four friendly <laughs> individuals, <laughs> we'd be happy to come there and make a project with you. Yeah, I wanted to say something about the um, uh, just the feedback and getting advice from each other, problem solving with each other. Um, because we knew and worked together 10 years ago as graduate students at Alfred, um, we had an intimate understanding of our roots as makers, sort of our evolution as makers, starting with 10 years ago. So I think we went into the residency in sort of a, a format that provided for uh, honesty and generosity and friendship in that way, very supportive network. Um, and also, I think all of our work is such that it pushes it pushes pretty far for forward. Like we don't really operate in these realms of uh, predictability. We're sort of like pushing forward with each project. So the material, literacy that all of us bring to the table is really helpful. So we're able to troubleshoot for each other and with each other and um, be able to reference each other's work even though it's, it may not be obvious in the finished pieces. I think there's a lot of um, overlap and conversation within the work, especially when you see it in the exhibition. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thank you all for joining us this morning.